plant, the nuclear's out of work, it's an economic slowdown. When your brother-in-law is out of work, it's a recession. When you're out of work, it's a depression. What's a depression? What's a depression? That music, I think, that we're going to hear is the sound of gloom and doom. And if we're playing it, well, that can only mean one thing. The great Mark Faber, author of the Gloom and Doom Report, and all jokes aside, when this man talks, markets, in fact, do listen. He correctly identified the tech bubble, and now he's setting his sights on China. Mark joins us on the phone from Bangkok. Uh, his time this morning. Mark, great to have you with us. Yeah, I'm actually in Shanghai. Oh, you're in Shanghai. Okay, fantastic. Shanghai. Happy New Year. Oh, Chiang Mai. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, when, it, <laughs> when it comes to uh, China, Mark, is that going to be the greatest threat to the uh, U.S. markets? Because I know in your report you said you would anticipate the U.S. markets to fall about 20 to 40 percent from the January highs we've seen. Well, I said 20 percent, but I think the issue for 2010 is to what extent China will slow down. It will certainly slow down because the loan growth we had last year, which was over a trillion dollars, and in January it actually accelerated to $200 billion. So in other words, bank loans in January were rising at an annual rate of something like $2.5 trillion on a GDP that is slightly over $4 trillion. It's not sustainable in the long run, and we have a lot of excess capacities in China in different industries, and in particular in the real estate market. So credit growth will slow down, and that will obviously slow is, down the economy. Are these areas in China then shorts, Mark? How are you playing this? Well, I think that uh, property stocks are on a rebound ashore. But uh, it may not collapse right away. But in general, I wouldn't buy Chinese stocks here, and I would be careful of any asset that benefited greatly from the China boom in 2009, because it's not sustainable. And these assets are basically industrial commodities that they have become right, so, now quite vulnerable. So, Mark, you'd be probably shorting something like the Chinalco and ACH or maybe even some of the refineries in China. What do you think about the domestic economy? Because we've been having the debate over the last couple of days that the Chinese may be ready to revalue their currency. They're ready to let the yuan, the yuan appreciate against the dollar and some, allow some of the other Asian currencies also to appreciate. Do you think that's going to happen? Because the world is also very preoccupied with that. Well, I'm not sure that the Chinese will let the you appreciate much right away, but I think over the next 10 years, you're looking at an appreciating currency. 10 uh, years is a long time, though. I mean, it, you uh, know, the expectation is this is something that could happen in the next year. Do you believe that's true? Yes, I mean, it could happen, say, 5% or so, but I would be looking at the doubling of the currency in value against the U.S. dollar over the next 10 years or so. Dr. Faber, it's Karen. Would you, um, if, if that China story were to play out as you expect, we would, I expect, see deflation. Would that make you a buyer of U.S. Treasuries? No, I think any kind of deflationary pressures would immediately lead to central banks around the world to print money again at the very high rate and that would especially apply to the United States. So I think that I would be a seller of long-term U.S. Treasuries on any rebound. So, Dr. Faber, where would you want to be looking forward 9 to 12 months? What are the assets that you believe investors should want to own? Well, I think that uh, not just for the next 12 months, but for the next 10 years, cash, and government bonds are unattractive because what we will get is money printing and higher and higher rates of inflation in the world. And so you want to be either in real estate or in commodities or in equities or in precious metals. And I'm separating here precious metals from commodities because commodities are very much driven by industrial production and capital spending whereas precious metals will be perceived as, say, a safe currency. Right. Uh, Dr. Faber, it is a pleasure to speak with you. Hope you will come on the show again sometime soon.
All right. So interesting comments here. You know, out of his uh, most recent report, the gloom doom, uh, the gloom boom and doom report. You know, guy Dominic. He had. <laughs> he's the number one subscriber. He has a very interesting chart uh, in terms of the annual gold production from from producers from 1970 to now, and it shows essentially that supplies are low. That miners have been producing less, and the demand, obviously, we know through the demand for ETS, which you probably out there are invested in is high for gold these days. It's good as gold again. I mean, that's what you do here if you believe that the world's in a difficult place on currency fronts. And then the other thing is the IMF's announced that they're going to sell the other slug of their, their big gold, which means central banks around the world have an appetite and have approached them to buy it. They wouldn't be selling this into a dead market. This will continue. And it seemed to me his overall theme was all about inflation, 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 with a chance of possible hyperinflation.